Um, welcome to the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research. My name is Julia Rothkopf, and I'm the program associate at YIVO. Today, we have David Stromberg joining us for a book talk about a newly published translation of Isaac Bashevis Singer's Gimple Tom called Simple Gimple, and he will be interviewed by David Roskies. And you can buy this wonderful new book on YIVO's website, and I will shortly put the link in the chat to purchase the book through YIVO. Um, and before we get started, I would just like to thank New Lair House, who is a co-sponsor of this program. Thank you so much for co-sponsoring. And just a word about YIVO. Um, for those of you who do not know us, we are a very, very special place for the celebration, contemplation, and exploration of Yiddish and Eastern European Jewish culture. We are located in New York City, where our library and archive contain over 24 million documents and 400,000 books. And these resources are used by researchers all around the world. We have also lots of classes on Yiddish language and culture, exhibitions, and public programs just like this one, where we aim to bridge the worlds of Jewish culture in our vast library and archival holdings. And we are very excited to have you all joining us today. Um, a bit about our speakers. David Stromberg is a writer, translator, and scholar whose work has appeared in The American Scholar, The Massachusetts Review, and Los Angeles Review of Books, amongst other publications. His recent books include Old Truths and New Clichés, an edited collection of Isaac Bashevis Singer's essays, and a speculative nonfiction novella, A Short Inquiry into the End of the World. His follow-up essay, The Eternal Hope of the Wandering Jew, appears in The Hedgehog Review. And joining him is David G. Roskies. He is the Saul and Evelyn Henkin Chair Emeritus in Yiddish Literature and Culture and a Professor Emeritus of Jewish Literature at the Jewish Theological Seminary. He also served as the Naomi Prower Kadar Visiting Professor of Yiddish Studies at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Dr. Roskies was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2012, and he is a cultural, cultural historian of Eastern European Jewry. A prolific, prolific author, editor, and scholar, he has published nine books and received numerous awards. In 1981, he co-founded with Dr. Alan Mintz, Proof Text, a journal of Jewish literary history, and he served for 17 years as editor-in-chief of the new Yiddish library series published by Yale University Press. A native of Montreal and a product of its Yiddish secular schools, Dr. Roskies was educated at Brandeis University, where he received his doctorate in 1975. And now I will hand it over to our guests. Hello, everyone. Hello. So we're all in different time zones. And uh, why don't we start with different time zones? Because there are really two different timelines here for the story, uh, uh, Gimple Tom. One in terms of Yiddish culture uh, and the other in terms of American Jewish culture. I think it is fair to say, David, that no one has followed and knows uh, with such intimacy the precise timeline of uh, Isaac Basheva Singer as you do, because you have followed all of his three persona, uh, Yitzhak Bashevis, his uh, Yiddish authorial voice, uh, Yitzhak Varshavsky, uh, that middle brow voice of a critic, and Dalit Segal. Somehow or other, you have all of those three uh, in place. So let's start with the timing. Uh, what is your sense of uh, the timing of this story uh, coming out in 1945? What's the breakthrough moment as, as you understand it? Um, the breakthrough moment. I mean, I think, I think there are there are there's there are it's as always, there's not one moment, but but a series of moments that lead to the to the breakthrough or to what I like to call the invention of 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 uh, Gimple Tom. And and the invention is um first of all, you know, as as Shmeruk obviously pointed out, and, and you as especially, um, the 1943 breakthrough moment. It's really 1942, right? Because he's actually writing the stories a year earlier, uh, but, but around 40, 41, 42, 43 is a breakthrough moment of the, mon of the monologue, finding a way to speak in the first person. But it's interesting that Bashevis had a hard time speaking in the first person as 
a an embodied character, let's say. Um, so he had to go through the gates of Hove, the, the demonic voice, as as the first person. Which of course isn't the person, but it's a first person voice. It's an I. So let's just remind the audience that what we're talking about is a series of short stories that begin to appear in uh, Sviva, a small, uh, a little magazine actually coming out of New York called uh, Das Gedenkbuch von Yetzirah, The Devil's Diary, where he's speaking in the devil's voice. Okay, so that's what you're referring to, right? Yes, so then, so, so then the question becomes, okay, well, how do you use a first person voice um, and, and tell a story from a different, from a human, an embodied perspective, let's say. Um, and I'll just jump for a second, sorry, to timeline. I'll jump to the early 60s where he writes his first um, first person character as, as a kind of a, a, a young Yiddish writer coming from, from, uh, from Poland. And in an, in an interview at that time, he says, well, I'm now writing my first first person novel. <laughs> and first person is much harder than anybody thinks. <laughs> um, so, so I think it's important to remember that he says that in 1962 or 63, because now we're flipped back 1943, and he, and he's starting to think, you know, to try to experiment with first person. So then, um, and I think the first person is the breakthrough of the story, also because as as we we've, we've spoken before, um, it's also where he so. That's part of the breakthrough. Another part of the breakthrough is rereading uh, Rabbi Nachman. Now, the interesting thing about that is that when he's writing, he, he wrote about Rabbi Nachman in the Fauverts under the name uh, Varshavsky um, in two periods, the two series of articles, one in 1939, end of 39, and also January 40, and one in uh, 44. What happened in those years? One was the the outbreak of World War II, and the other was the death of his brother. So, and he talks about how his youngest brother, who was who was a rabbi, um, was the one who introduced him to 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 Rabbi Nachman. So, it seems like in in moments of of real loss and and spiritual need he goes back to this thing that he got from his brother something very very special so he goes back to these stories and that's one of that's another one moment of the breakthrough um let's not let's not forget the essay that he uh writes about problems of yiddish uh prose in america where he basically says yiddish secular culture in america bankrupt uh, Yiddish is not really a living language in America. It's an obsolescent language. So I, as a realist writer, I cannot use the language of American Jews. Uh, it's simply too vulgar. Uh, it, it, it can't be turned into a, a literary language. So the only, the only possibility for a Yiddish writer in America is to return to the past and reimagine the past. Yiddish has to be remain what it always was, the language of Yiddishkeit. So that's his manifesto. So to, so interest so another so two inter, definitely yes, definitely one of the one of the key moments of the of the breakthrough and also two things about that. <laughs> one is that one is that he's saying it in the future tense but he's already doing it. It's already in the past tense because he's already done it. Right, that's an important thing. And the other thing is, you know, he's not doing that in the 20s, there in Poland. Right? It, it's, 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 a, it's a perspective that he himself wasn't able to, he did in, in a, a little later in the early 30s, but in the 20s, he wasn't doing it so much. So, so yes, yeah, so he realizes we need to use not just the past, events but the past modes of storytelling and the past modes of conveying folk tales right 
in, in today's in today's situation, but we can't just have the same ones. Meaning, uh, he said, I'm just per imagining, right? I'm saying you could kind of interpret. Like, I'm not saying the Bashevis actually said this to himself, but I think you can kind of pretend to, to to give him a voice and say, okay, I can read Rabbi Nachman and see all the things, but I can't give this the the tale, the Rabbi Nachman's tale of of a Chocham and a Tam, right? The the sage and the, and the simpleton to somebody in New York, even a Yiddish reader in New York, and expect them to get all the layers. So there, so there has to be some reinvention of it, some re-adaptation of it. And I think that's one of the, another one of the, the key breakthrough moments. And I do think that part of that came from his reading of the famous under 40 article, which came out in the Jewish contemporary uh, record where American Jewish literary luminaries or young luminaries are talking about Jewishness and, and what Judaism and Jew, being Jewish means to them. And he sees it, the gaps. This kind of is another moment where things kind of come into, into shape. Um, and and so there's this maybe, extraordinary confluence you're telling me and it's all going to come together now in March of 1945. So yeah. this story is going to appear in a venue, which for Bashevis is a, a, a really new venue. Uh, yeah. Yiddish Kemfer was a, after all, a labor Zionist weekly. Um, and it came out in a folio format. But for the holidays, there was a special holiday supplement, usually the, the Kemper was 20 to 22 pages long. And this is a, I don't know, a, a, a 90 page, uh, a 96 page long supplement. And there is this story in the fourth place. And it comes, it's for Passover, for Pesach. Right. Okay. Right. So that's not coincidental. No. No. I mean, because readers are going to be sitting down. Even even the secular Yiddishists, even the labor Zionists are going to have a Seder, right? And at this Seder, they're going to read about the four sons. And one of them is a Tom. Right. Right. And they're going to say, oh, well, of course this story came out here. Right. <laughs> um, and again, I think it's, it's important to understand the doubling. Yes, Beshevis was reading about these American Jewish authors who write in English and don't have a lot of Yiddish guide or no Yiddish, et cetera. But he also understands by this point, it's 10 years into being in America. Um, and it's 10 years in which the last five or six, five and a half years, he's been writing articles on Jewish tradition in Yiddish for the Fobots. So he says, the Yiddish speakers also need a primer. <laughs> Um, and so, and so, it's it's part of what I think gives give the story. It's I don't want to use the word transcendental in the wrong in the wrong sense, but its ability to transcend any single sort of context, because it was always built, it was always devised to be a, a locus of this confluence. You know, it was, it was, it was not devised, maybe it's not the right word, but um, composed and, and brought together in, in, it is a product of confluence. Of course, also, the, you know, the tide of the war is changing. He knows that, he's writing about it in, in the photos every week, you know. Um, that's another part of the story, you know. When, at what point can you suddenly express? A, a, of course, in 1942, you speak from the perspective of of the Yetzirah because the Yetzirah is is running the world. But in the beginning of end of 44, beginning of 45, there's a little there's the the tide of the of the war is turning. You can afford to express some, however ironic, however complicated form of faith so if you look at that uh special 96 page uh, issue 
you would hardly imagine that it, it comes from a, a secular place uh, because the first, uh, the, he, he appears as number four. The first thing is this, uh, a translation of Shirat Hayam, uh, the song at the sea, uh, the splitting of the sea. Then there is a translation of, uh, of a part of the Talmud from uh, Psachim. So there's a, a movement of really reconnecting with the sources of Jewish tradition. Uh, and Gimbel's voice and the folk monologue and the fact that he is called a Tom uh, fits perfectly into this uh, renegotiation of, of Yiddish secularism with Jewish tradition at this critical moment. So there, there was obviously, a, uh, I mean, a marriage here and uh, a receptivity. So you decide that you are going to rename the story Gimbal the Simple, okay? In order to convey, I, I imagine uh, that he is a Tom and all the positive associations that the word Tom carries in, in this tradition, right? So. Uh, you have Jacob, uh, who is called Ishwali, and you have Job, uh, who is blameless. That's how they translate Tom, blameless, right? And uh, upright. He feared God and shunned evil. And then you have the third of the four sons. I figured ah. if we're going to talk about oh, it. Wow. Just, not All planned. Right. Oh, not wow. Planned. That's great. <laughs> There it is. Oh, my God. Pesach, Pesach. That's <laughs> fabulous. And here's the here's the inhalt. Here's the lineup. Yeah. There we go. Right. Um, so on this, you, you, if you halfway down the page, there's yeah. something called monologue in a plenum Yiddish by Aaron Zaitlin. So you basically have two modern uh, Yiddish modernists from Poland uh, adopting this superannuated, old-fashioned form as modern writers. You have Gimpel Tom, and you have uh, Aaron Seitlin's monologue in a plain in Yiddish. So there is something really profound happening at this moment in time, and Bashevis is really there at the very center of it, wouldn't you say? Definitely, he's he's there, and 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 like you said, he's also not, it's 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 a new place for him. Um, and and yet, right, and yet, from today's perspective, right, that's that's the again when you you consider how a story that appears in such a specific place with such specific um, context and, 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 and with some such specific other pieces, how it just travels afterward. It takes time, but, but, but once it starts traveling, you, know, you can't stop it. Um, I will just say that I didn't decide to call it Simple Gimple. That was that was on the the the, the partial um, um, trend, you know the partial um, play script translation that I found. Um, I my my idea to, when I when I started thinking about translating was to call it Gimple the Idiot. Um, ah. to, and why would that be, perchance, having <laughs> something to do with Dostoevsky, maybe? Yeah, to bring in the Dostoevsky and, um, you know, angle, which is also present, obviously, there in, 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 in various ways. Um, but that's only I, obvious to you. You want to add another sentence? How is Gimpel uh, uh, Prince Mishkin? Well, so, th again, this, this, this is built on another, on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a parallel understanding that, that, um, that Satan and Gorai, Satan and Gorai, which was the Satan and Gorai, which was his first novel published serially uh, in thirty three, and then in the book form in thirty five, and then again in forty three, um, 
was essentially a reimagining, similarly how, to how he reimagined or readapted um, Rabbi Nachman, it was a re reimagining of demons, of Dostoevsky's demons. Um, and there's, he admits it in some interview that was published as a memory of a conversation after his death that he translated Shadim. Um, but it wasn't published. Now, why wasn't it published? We don't know. Uh, because another publication uh, by, uh, by another author translator was published around the same time. So maybe there was no point in publishing too. Um, but, but, but there's, there's a suggestion that he had a very intimate relationship with, with Dostoevsky in, in that case. So, you know, Prince Mishkin and, and the idiot in general, the idiot is itself based on, Dostoevsky's idiot is itself based on, um, the folkloric character of the holy fool in in Russian folklore. Okay. Uh, and and Mishkin is uh, essentially a um, uh, an orphan as well, and and is an, and is complete outsider in his own society. Right. The the novel begins. The idiot begins with Mishkin a, arriving in Russia for the first time since he's a child, in Petersburg for the first time since he's a child. So he speaks Russian, but he speaks it a little funny. He doesn't understand any of the cultural codes. Um, and yet, and, and he wants to, to, to be entered into Russian society, into Russian life, um, which even though it's not so obvious in Gimbal Tam as it's narrated, but once you understand the context, you understand that you know there uh, there was a tradition or a, a tendency to find people who came from from the margin of society and marry them together to sort of tie up loose ends, let's say. Um, you know, if you have if you have a, a sex worker on the at the end of of the of the shtetl, if you can get her to marry someone, then 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 you you sort of at least on a community level achieved a, uh, a slightly more uh, normative um, shell. Even if in reality she continues having children from other men, et cetera, et cetera, at least from the outside, now she's married, right? At least, at least now when the kids are born, there's, there's a father to give them a name and to, and to throw a little bash for them. At the shul, um, so 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 the, so the manifold la layers, even before you read the first paragraph, are uh, you have the Tom of Jewish tradition, you have Jacob, you have Job, you have Reb Nachman. Um, now you have uh, Dostoevsky's The Idiot, um, and. There's also, go, going back at least as far as Chaucer, the fool is the cuckold, right? right? So he is a cuckolded husband, right? Whose wife is famously uh, promiscuous. Um, and then, and then there is the line, the famous line that you reinstated into the translation that was uh, excised from uh, Saul Bellow's translation, where when he is told that the baby, that, uh, you know, his first child is very premature and he goes to see the rabbi and, and isn't he, or no, the rabbi's assistant uh, and, and, the rab, and he, he gets an explanation, a rationalization. And then he, Gimple himself comes up with that sentence uh, and you translate that as, you know, what uh, little Jesus uh, didn't have a father at all. So look, most of half the world believes in immaculate conception. So talk to me about baby Jesus. And I mean, I think, you know, there's been, a, there's certain interpretations have considered from a from a kind of a, a flattened perspective okay this this line is here in the Yiddish it's not here in the English what does it mean and and it and and it, they've 
they're flattened, I would say, because they, or maybe they're over, overfilled, right? They have too much volume because they give some sense of um, intention to the omission of the line. And I think- It becomes it, overdetermined. It's overdetermined, but specifically because from what I, from from my sense of things and, and my sense of, 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 of the historical way in which the story was translated. So now we've just, to be clear, we've moved from 45 to 52, 53, um, is that, you know, you have to, as a writer and as a translator, I always look at, at the conditions of production. That's really the thing that I would like to look at, to consider, to figure out how things come together. Also, everything we talked about earlier of how Gipple came to be is, is the conditions of production. How was it, how did it come together? So same with the translations. What were the conditions of production? First of all, let's just say, let's, there was Irving Howe, Eliezer Greenberg, and, and Saul Bellow are the main characters. In one of the versions, Irving Howe is not there at all. <laughs> uh, and in that version, all this takes place actually in uh, in Princeton, because Bell is actually too busy to come into, into the city to do this translation. He doesn't have any time for it, which is why Laser Greenberg goes all the way there, sits with him, reads it out loud to him, and he types it up, and they do it in an afternoon. Okay? So in, in Howe's version, it takes place in New York City, and he's there, and they drink a schnapps. Regardless, we, we know that, that it happened more or less in the afternoon, and we know that the Greenberg, the, the laser Greenberg was, was there reading it out loud. So A, he should be a co-translator, you know, from my perspective. This is this is a question of a co-translation between Eliezer Greenberg and, and Saul Bellow, but it doesn't look as good on paper. So we just write Saul Bellow plus Greenberg doesn't want the credit anyway, so it's okay. Um, but when you're working like that, and when you're working with that kind of speed, um, anything that that takes a little more thinking or a little more nuance or a little more finessing, et cetera, is just out because you don't have the time for it. And I think that um, you know, a mention of Jesus at all was enough for them to say, well, okay. How central is this really to the story? You know what? <laughs> Forget it. Let's go. Let's move on to the next paragraph. You can see it happening. Um, and I think that it's not, you know, the perspective isn't as, as, as it may seem to some, if, if you consider the omission purposeful, then it must be because it's too sensitive of a topic. Yes. Right? But really from the, from the perspective of the story, it's more or less what a generally uneducated Jewish person might know about Jesus. Right. It's not more or less than that. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they say that even Jesus had no father. Right. Little Jesus. So, so I think that, that the omission of it really just show, it's more about how it was, the conditions of the translation and not so much how critical Bashevis was of Christianity, which I don't mm -hmm. think was, was what was coming through in that sentence at all. So let's talk about uh, monologue and uh, the challenge that you faced uh, retranslating this and finding a believable voice. Um, because it's, uh, it's not a simple monologue by any means. Uh, there are voices within voices. It's extremely dialogical, right? There is the voice of Frampol, the first voice we hear. Um, if I may uh, quote uh, from your translation, uh, this is Frampol speaking. Uh, you know, Gimpol, the rabbi's wife is giving birth. Uh, Frampol says, uh, the Lord is a king and you're a jackass. Um, Gimple, the Kaiser's coming to Frampol. Gimple, the moon fell down in Turbin. Uh, Gimple, Podole Lambskin found a treasure behind the bathhouse. Gimple, there's a fair going on in the heavens. Okay, so that's the voice of the community. Uh, it's, uh, it's really tough. They're really hard on him. The communal voice is, 
is uh, extremely aggressive, wouldn't you say? Uh, Mean-spirited, um, almost verging on the violent. That's, but he's managed somehow to incorporate that voice into his own. Because these are only scattered quotations. Soon enough, Elka is going to appear on the scene. And right. boy, does she have a voice. Uh, uh, her, her voice. And that's, in fact, what he says about her. Um, uh, I'm quoting from page 14. She had such power. When she gave me one of her looks, I was paralyzed. And her expressions, she could let loose with fire and brimstone. And it was somehow extremely charming. Worth right. kissing every word. She wormed her way into your heart and you lay on the oven all carved up like a roast <laughs> and wanting more. <laughs> okay, so... That, uh, that was, was one of the hard... I don't remember it now in the Yiddish, but it was one of the hardest clauses to translate because some of, in some cases, also, also in the case that I gave, I don't talk about this one, but in the case of, because this I actually translated, but in the case of um, uh, of the stars shining, Sakonis um, Nefoshis, um, there are in the way that he writes it, and and I, I can't speak to whether it, I don't know, I really can't tell how, why this is, but there are some some clauses that aren't even grammatically quite properly situated you know um and and that sense especially was very hard you know the carved up like a roast you really had I, I had to kind of fill in the the image there um and and I I'm pretty sure I don't I also don't remember at this point exactly I have somewhere a file that has his parts separate from my parts you know bolded so I know who did what but I, I feel like I did this part. <laughs> um, the Franco part was from his from his play script, right? Because um, because that was an easier thing to to uh -huh. to, to have characters on stage say, right? Um, so uh, uh, what I love about this passage is the verbal aggression and how it seems clear to me that she's acting out all of his repressed aggression on on his behalf so yes. the attraction is of a very passive male and an, a hyper aggressive woman who's acting out on his behalf and he can't get enough of it because she's yeah, talking she bad she's talking she bad and gimple will never say a bad thing about anybody he says i have one fault i can't get angry exactly right so that's the key to his character actually right is that he can't get angry until he does, right? That's the big right. change. Meaning, people that's the crisis of faith. That people focus on the fact that he overcomes the desire for revenge because he has his dream with Elka, and that later in the story he he urinates in the dough and he starts to bake it, but then he has a dream about Elka. He's he's tempted by the Yetzel by the evil spirit, to do this thing, and then he does it, but then he visited by Elka spirit and he realizes this is not the way to go and he buries all the breath. Um, no spoilers, hopefully. But um <laughs> but but that's we could call that the plot climax, right? The the climax of the events. But the yes. emotional Climax, right? The the affective narrative, the the, the affect narrative, right. is when he gets angry, mm -hmm. right? Actually, you know, from a normative perspective, again, we say, oh, it's so good that he overcame his desire for revenge, but from an emotional perspective, oh, it's so good that he finally was ready to take revenge. <laughs> ah, interesting. You can't get. You can't become a a um, a whole person, right? You can't embody yourself and your emotions and and what's been done to you and the injustice until you get angry about it. 
Now, it does not mean that you should then urinate in everybody's bread. But you should want to. Or you should at least have the anger to, to, to consider it seriously. Um, and yeah, I think you're right. That's why this, this, pair, this, this passage is all about him fusing into her anger. And he loves it. He loves it because he can't do it yet. Okay. So the other uh, aggressive voice uh, is that of the devil. Remember, uh, after he urinates into the dough, what happens next is that he falls asleep and the right. devil comes uh, in his dream. And here's and, the uh, uh, very nice illustration. <laughs> but it's, the it's a fantastic. Yeah, that's my favorite. There yeah. she there's the devil. <laughs> um, um, who has by, a yeah. voice of its own. Yes. Uh, and he and the devil says, well, what are you doing, uh, Gimple? And he says, you know, what should I be doing? Uh, eating kreplach or something like that? You know, he makes a joke out of it. He tries to. Uh, but. He allows the devil his due. And the devil says something. Unbelievable, he says, what, what is there a God? No, there's nothing. There's just a deep mire. Right. Is what the devil says, which is what. Gimple allows himself to say in the voice of the devil, okay? So that's, uh, I, I would say, just following up on, on what you just said, that not only does he allow himself to be angry, but he allows himself to blaspheme. Right. And then comes the superego in the guise of Elka, who says, but I didn't deceive anyone. Uh, you fool, you fool. I didn't deceive anyone except for myself, and now I'm paying for it. So Elka then becomes the voice of reconciliation. And at the end of the story, she visits him regularly in his dreams, and he wakes up in tears. Uh, right. So her, her place in the story has completely shifted. The same Elka who acted out all of his aggression for him then becomes the voice of acceptance and reconciliation and love at the very uh, penultimate moment of the story uh, when Gimple has already begun to formulate his own theology. Right. You know, it's it's also interesting because the the the, the tears at the end um, is also an image from the end of the idiot. I just was thinking suddenly oh. um, when Rogozhin and 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 um, and Mishkin are found together, their tears are sort of melding. Um, if I remember the image correctly, but there's there's an image like that at the end as well. Um, well, she, because it's kind of like, you know, Gimple never actual, right, Gimple's a, a, a tale, right, it's a fiction, okay, so he's not a person, but he represents or he he embodies fictionally these different parts of a person, not of Bashevi. I'm not saying he's a projection of the of the author. I'm saying as a human, it has, it has these different elements. And they never get integrated in him as a character. But some get more integrated than others, or some realizations lead him to certain choices. Um, and when you when you look at the narrative of his life together, you do get a whole person. Okay, so Elka, as a as 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 a living character, um, never gives him enough in. You know, she she she's never vulnerable enough with him to create any actual um, real time let's say intimacy slash fusion connection not even fusion but connection but out of real time she is the mother of the children he raised 
she is his love object. And again, the mother of his other love objects which are his children. And, and marrying her did allow him the closest thing he could have had with his emotional maturity to a married life. Um, a, a family life, which he never had because he was an orphan. So when he finds the truth, he can't live the lie anymore, so he leaves. But he's left in a kind of, you could say I'm almost a post-traumatic way, but a post-traumatic that's also filling. He's left with all of the emotional impressions. He's left to sort of integrate it in himself. He cannot actuate it with others, right? But he can still put it together inside. I would say that the proof of his uh, integration uh, uh, is twofold. One, uh, the monologue itself, which is the most perfect uh, Yiddish monologue ever written, and the way that uh, he is able to orchestrate the these diverse voices into his own and turn it into one complete uh, monologue soliloquy, which presumably he is delivering in a flock house to a group of strangers on the very uh, edge of, uh, of the abyss. He's about to die and he's telling his story, but there's no response. He has, there's an audience, but uh, they are passive. We never even hear their response. So on that level, uh, uh, reading it through Bakhtin's eyes, it's uh, it's a perfect orchestration of, uh, uh, it's a polyphonic uh, uh, monologue. But also the last paragraphs are extraordinary. Remember that it begins so naively um, and in such a lively manner, describing himself as a boy who's always the butt of everybody's joke. The central part of him of his story is uh, Gimple as a cuckolded husband and the struggle for his own uh, manhood, which is denied him over and over again. My own reading is that he never even consummates his marriage. I don't even think he ever sleeps with her, but that's my personal reading. <laughs> and then we hear his voice in uh, wise old age when he becomes a wandering storyteller sage. And the language the shifts and, and the whole discourse becomes uh, theological. So I actually see him narrating his life story in, in a rather coherent way. Agreed. And that's, you know, one of the other lines that was a throwaway line and, and mistranslated or undertranslated maybe in, in the Bella was when, when he decides to, to, to get married and he says, well, in the, in the Bella, it's, well, you can't go life through life unscathed or can, can't expect to or something like that. Yes. Um, but the, but the Yiddish is, is you can't die in your lifestyle that way. Which is like your Talis Cotton. Which you translated, you can't be a bachelor all your life. You can't die a bachelor, which is which I translated, but then I found that Bashev is also translated it that way. Right. But the joke is, or the 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 the, the reason why you can't die in your in your Talis Cotton in your in your in your uh tzitzis, right? In your in your undergar in your undershirt is that you need it you need your atalis to be your tahrichi. Right? If you don't get married, you don't right. get a talis. Right. There's, there's nothing to bury you in because it's because because the talis cotton doesn't cover your body. <laughs> so the moment when he's there at the end and he's looking at at his at his satchel and he says my burial shrouds are ready. Right. Correct. Right? It's because, because he, as, as, as failed as the whole thing was, it was. And a failed thing is better than a no thing. 
There's a third way in which he arrives at closure, which is extremely subtle. If we go back to Reb Nachman and um, Bashevis's debt, acknowledged debt, now he really owns uh, Reb Nachman fully, uh, as he will at the end of the family Muscat, where he, he shows you uh, Bratzlav or Hasidim uh, dancing as the bombs are falling on Warsaw. Um, the, the last sentence uh, reads as follows, the last amazing paragraph. Yeah. Um, uh, this is on page 33. My shroud is ready in my sack. Another beggar is waiting for my straw bed. God willing, when the time comes at last, I'll go there with joy. Whatever may be there, it is all true without trickery, without mockery or lies. Thank God. There, even Gimbal cannot be deceived. So the word for mockery is leitzonis, on leitzonis. And that's the key, because the Tam in uh, Reb Nachman's story uh, says, I'm willing to listen to anything. You can talk to me about anything. No on leitzonis. Just don't make a mockery of me. So there you have it. There's the same word where this is now coming spontaneously from him as an, and this is his response, uh, his theological, his moral, his ethical response. There is a higher, uh, a higher essence. There is a truth that is otherworldly. I believe in that. And there, Dalton Kahneman, Gimplen nicht op nach, and the last, I feel. Up now. So in Yiddish, you can't do, of course, you can't do that. Uh, the, the distinction between uh, uh, a fool, uh, a tam, and a nar. There, I won't be a nar anymore. You can't deceive me. And, it's, and, and just to, to bring it back to what you said about the monologue, is that whereas in Rabbi Nachman's tale, the tam is a character, he speaks in the first person only when there's quotation marks. Bashevis took that and made him the narrator, which I think is, if we go back to your first question, that's the breakthrough. The breakthrough is the Nar, the, the Tom is going to tell his own story. Okay. All right. I think we're ready for some questions. We are. All right. Thank you both. Um, this was a fascinating discussion. We do a few audience questions, so let's get to it. Um, so we have one question that is about um, the connection between that that you made between Gimple Tom and the idiot. Um, and this audience member writes that a relevant element in the idiot is that Michigan has epilepsy and this disability in particular is, also, is often used as a way of idealizing people. Um, pure people, etc., when people with epilepsy are not being vilified. Um, and in this person's forthcoming novella about a graphic artist and cartoonist with epilepsy, um, the character struggles with this dual portrayal of her. Um, and so do you see echoes in Gimple Tom of this kind of dualism that is applied to people with this disability? I mean, I think that that in in The Idiot, um there's there's a big there, there's a very important section in the idiot and i would suggest uh, the person to look at this where um um it's where the narrator slash it's very close between the narrator and mishkin talk for this narrator's voice he talks about um the loss of dialectical thinking so it's not so much that it's dualism or or splitting. It, it is about splitting between good and bad. Everybody, it, it splits the thinking, but it's really the inability, again, this is why we, I was talking so much about integration. It's the ability to bring the things closer together and back together, the good and the bad together. Um, and, and so in The Idiot, Dostoevsky uses 
uh, the ecstasy moment, okay, to say the ecstasy is so great that Mishkin loses sight of the darker side, uh, which goes back to what to what Roski was saying, what, to, what David was saying about that the the blasphemy, the 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 Yetzirah, the devil, right? That that you have to bring the dark side back into it. All right, great. Um, so we have another question about Singer himself and if he read the literature being written in Hebrew at the time, um, and did he think that Hebrew literature and Yiddish literature were two separate worlds, or did he see them as connected and complementing one another? He definitely saw them as connected. Um, he, there, and some of the things that he wrote about this will be coming out in um, a little bit in, the, in, this, in a new volume in November of his cultural criticism, but even more in the next volume, which will be maybe in a year or two. Um, but essentially, you know, we could we can say in, in a short in a short way that um, that from his perspective, and at least at the time, Hebrew and Yiddish literature both required some level of knowledge of of Yiddishkeit in the sense of Yiddish life, Yiddish tradition, et cetera, Jewish tradition, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so they were by nature um, much closer um, than. Jewish literature and other languages. He also has an amazing passage in the essay that I referred to earlier, uh, this polemical article, which was actually uh, fiercely uh, controversial uh, uh, concerning uh, problems of Yiddish prose in America, where he says the following, Yiddish and Hebrew have now changed roles. Right. It used to be in the 19th century that a Hebrew wasn't a spoken language. So the first novelists like uh, Abramovich Mendeleev had to make up a fake language and make believe that the characters were speaking Hebrew, but they were actually speaking a completely artificial language. Whereas now, and now means 1943, mind you, Hebrew is, going, is becoming the spoken language of the Jews, and that's going to change the nature of, of Hebrew prose. Yiddish, which started off purely as a spoken vernacular, uh, had the upper hand. But now he says, because he's, uh, if we want to bring Yiddish alive on the page, we can't use American Yiddish because it's potato Yiddish. It's so vulgar. We can't use this language. We have to create an artificial language. And he says, we have to learn not from life, but from books. Yiddish writers have to go back to school. And they have to be reminded of the way it was when Yiddish was the warp and woof of, of Jewish life. So the source of the, the living language for a Yiddish writer in America is textual. Uh, so the, the, the roles of Yiddish and Hebrew, he says, have, have, have now been completely reversed. And, and I would just add, by the 50s, he's writing articles in the Favelts under... Uh, his pseudonyms that are talking about the new words coming out in Hebrew <laughs> and explaining them in Yiddish. <laughs> but I think one of them is called, you know, when 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 a uh, when a uh, when a yosem is a yatom, and he spells it out yatom in in Yiddish. You know, yud pasachalat. You know, um, so so it's a question that continues that he continues to to develop and think about as the question itself continues to develop. All right, great. Um, so we have another question about the literary influences in um, Gimple Tom, as you spoke about in the during the book talk. Um, this person is wondering in particular if Gimple Tom could have been perhaps influenced by um, James Joyce's Ulysses, um, in particular by Molly Bloom, um, and or any aspects of Don Quixote, in which there are stories within stories, um, which include infidelities. Don Quixote, definitely. Uh, James Joyce. I think, to use one of my favorite Yiddish expressions, that's a bit far-fetched. Um, and also, let's not forget that that the idiot is inspired by Dostoevsky's idiot is inspired by uh, by Don Quixote, where who where the book features prominently itself, and the character uh, features prominently. So, you know, Don Quixote is 
is is in so many things and certainly in here yeah Great, and I think we have time for one more question. So let's end by talking about the illustrations in this book. When this book, when this very colorful book arrived at the Givo offices, um, we all thought, whoa, it's so colorful, which is a big difference than a lot of the books on our shelf. Um, and before, um, I believe it was Dovid showed um, the, the drawing, the illustration of the devil. And this colorfulness and these illustrations are because of Liana Fink um, and her illustrations in this book. And David, would you be able to talk a bit more about that collaboration um, and how she contributed to publishing this book? I wish I could. It was that really was the work of the publisher. Um, and and you'd have to ask her um, and see her perspective. I think they're I think they're great. And I think that um, the publisher did a great job in both working with her and laying it out and everything. Um, and I, I think that they work very well together is the, is the best that I can say. Okay, great. Well, that is all the time we have. Thank you both David and Dovid for joining us today. And thank you to our audience. Um, we are selling the book in the Givo store. So please take it, please purchase it from us. It is wonderful. Um, and very colorful, as I mentioned, and I will just put the link in the chat now. Um, okay, and thank you everyone for joining us today, and I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Thank you.